Hello, welcome back to another of my new video. In today's video, we'll be looking at something really interesting called a electronic ballast for UV lamps, which will be designed for DC 12 volts. The DC 12 volts is quite interesting because this voltage is rarely used to drive any fluorescent lights or lamp, a lamp at all because most fluorescent lamps require a 220 volts to run the circuitry but this one uses a really really clever technique and the oscillator circuits to drive the lamp perfectly with a really good result as well as good amount of cathode heating and overall light output with the steadiness with no like what you call rectification that's which can occur with a lot of other type of fluorescence driver yeah, to see the internal circuitry of this ballast we can take apart the case which can show you here this is the entire ballast circuitry and here's the bulb. Because we're using the internal capacitor, we do not rely on this starter capacitor provided here. In this circuit, we can see there's an electrolytic capacitor for rectification, a LC first resonator tank with the first step-up transformer, two transistors of D882 or the 2ACD882 with a step-up transformer. And here will be the base drive transformer for providing the feedback for the two transistors and two diode, which is 14007. We did not use the high speed diode for an important re uh, reason later on, you can see. And two resistors being provided with a final resonant capacitor, a resonant and also the ballasting inductor. And here is the back of the circuitry you can see here. But the main thing is that I've drawn the entire diagram over here, you can see being shown. Here is the two transistor. It works a bit similar to the Royal Baxander oscillators, but however, there is no uh, inductor here. The inductor in a Royal Baxander oscillator here will be helping us to prevent cross conduction. If cross conduction happens during a Royal circuitry, what will happen is that this cross conduction happens at a really small duration of time. But at that time, the inductor would resist immediate change in currents, which is the property of inductor. Inductor doesn't like the sudden change in currents, as the capacitor doesn't like the sudden change in voltage. So what would happen during cross-conduction in a Rohrbach-Sandor oscillator is that the inductor will start to build its magnetic field. But when the cross-conduction disappears, inductor will dissipate all its energy back into the circuit again. But here we don't have it. So the timing of the two transistors is incredibly important in order to prevent any cross-conduction, as well as the correct amount of base drive. Here we can see a 100k resistor being provided to the base of the first transistor here, which is NPN as well. So this provided is for a kick kickstart for the entire oscillation of the circuitry. This would happen is that without this resistor, the circuit would not oscillate by its own. So with this resistor, it provides a small amount of base current. The small amount of base current will turn the transistor on. And here's the winding direction. It's also really important for this circuit to work correctly. For example, if we assume this transistor turn on first, the dots here will become negative as well as this dot here will become negative. So this dot here will become negative, which will pull this space down. But the one without the dots will become the positive, which will allow this transistor to conduct more currents. As this become negative, the currents will actually be pushed through and here coming back through the diode as well. So the diode is actually the slow speed. If you have a really fast speed on the oscilloscope, you might see more distortions in harmonic, whereas the slow speed 14007 will make, mitigate this problem. With the amount of the base drive being provided by this toroidal transformer, which has 14 to 14 ratio, so the 10 ohm resistor here will be limit the amount of currents uh, the overall the transistor can receive which can be changing for different values on different type of transistor with different gain. 
And here we can see is the choke. This part of the entire circuitry, if we ignore the rest, will be working exactly the same as any other compact fluorescence lamp or nearly most of all the modern electronic fluorescence lamp drivers. Relies on a first capacitor that blocks all DC, only allows AC to come past, so which is DC blocking capacitor, and then pass through the lamp with a resonator starting up capacitor. I have generally the value between 3 nanofarad all the way to 8 nanofarad, but in our case it's 4.7 nanofarad, which can just vary just slightly, and the LC oscillation will still kick start. And here's the inductor choke, which you can find some common values, which you can check out with different values, because the choke actually have different reactants depending on different frequencies, so each lamp might be just slightly different, but they may all have some similar values. The important thing about this choke is that it has an air gap. The air gap is in order to prevent the saturation of the core of the material. If you do have saturation, then the inductance will drop drastically according to the BH curves, if you can find in some diagram. And so for the failure of this circuitry, it's actually really, really easy to repair. Generally, what could happen if the lamp, the ballast fail is that if the lamp itself breaks, the glass broke, basically what will happen is that the arc, arc would not initiate throughout the entire discharge tube. If there's no arc can be driven, what happens is these two components is in LC parallel resonate, uh, resonate mode. So if it's in LC parallel resonate, what will happen? Oh no, LC series resonation actually is called. LC series resonation will actually result in the overall reactants be really, really small. Thus, a huge amount of current can actually flow through the circuit in a lot of circuits, which causes the failure of the driver transistor. So what will happen is that the driver transistor will actually be broken. Once those driver transistor are broken, is that the circuit, entire circuit fails. And what you can do is to first to check this capacitor here, find out whether it's shorted or not. If it's not shorted, just simply change those two transistors over here. Really easy fix to repair. And this part of the circuit generally would not easily fail because actually there's not really high voltage being initiated here. But here might be sometimes a chance of the arc flash over through the inductor. But this core is really easy to fix because you just need to find a similar choke and put it on. And with some trial and error, you get it to work again. The only difficult part is getting this inductor, which generally it will not fail, unless you have a short circuit, for example, you connect it the wrong way and cause a huge current to flow through the transistor and potentially destroying the coil as well. So to prevent this problem, you can do is add a fuse to this line. For example, you know the circuits would not draw more than one amp because you're driving a five watts fluorescent tube. So for this reason, you can add a one amp fuse here. Anything shorts out, the fuse will blow immediately, but the windings on the coil will not get damaged at all. And that's it, hope you like it. And I shall see you in another of the new video.